Hello, I'm John Rossi, a touring drummer with a love of all things animal. When I'm on the road, I visit as many zoos, aquariums. Hey, wait a minute. What's going on? Hey, what's going on there? Hello? Hello? We interrupt your regularly scheduled program to bring you Rossafari Zoo News. News you can use from the world of zoos and conservation. Every week, we bring you breaking news and analysis from around the globe, featuring the animals you love and the people who care for them. And here's your anchorman, John Rossi. Hi, hello, how are you? Welcome back to Rossafari Zoo News, your look at everything going on in the world of zoos, aquariums, conservation, and general animal weirdness. Y'all, I don't know if I've mentioned this on the podcast, but uh, I am recording this on Wednesday, September 6th, fairly early, because tomorrow morning at the butt crack of dawn, actually pre-dawn, I'm going to be getting on a plane, as I do, to go and play the drums, as I do, uh, but it's just going to be a small little tour of my show under the sun so we've done it twice now at some pretty cool venues but uh we've actually lined up a multi-day tour of this show that i i wrote and created and have changed around a bit and stuff and i'm i'm ridiculously proud of that fact i i can't believe that this is going to be a thing um so i am heading down tomorrow to uh gulfport mississippi where we'll have our first show on friday and uh, then we've got a few more dates coming up. And actually, when I fly away from this little tour, uh, I'm going to be leaving Birmingham, Alabama to head right to Columbus, Ohio for the start of the AZA conference. Uh, my travel day home, so to speak, from the tour is actually the first day of the AZA conference. So my hope is to make it from the airport in time for some of the icebreaker that evening. Um my life is crazy and I wouldn't have it any other way. But yeah, my show, my show is going to going to be doing this little tour and hopefully this this means good news for um for next year as well. So uh yeah, lots of lots of cool stuff going on with that. I'm very excited. Um and of course, because I am me and because this is how I roll, uh, I reached out to the Mississippi Aquarium, which is in Gulfport, Mississippi. It's a new facility. It only opened in 2020. And so um, when my plane lands on Thursday, uh, instead of spending the day getting ready for my show like a normal human being, I'm going to head to the aquarium and do a couple interviews there and and hang out and just kind of have a good time with the with the team there. I'm really excited about that opportunity. Uh, I have reached out to two other facilities uh, along the road, but um, honestly, I don't know if I'll hear back from them just because it's kind of a um, late in the game kind of thing. I, you know, I'm, I'm leaving tomorrow. It's a short tour. Uh, I was I was too busy, you know, making sure that the tour was good and happening. Uh, but yeah, my, my buddy Jason, uh, who, who is the, uh, the guy in Great Balls of Fire who, who wrote that show and plays piano and that actually plays bass and some guitar in, um, Under the Sun. And he's the one who realized the aquarium was right there. And he just sent me a uh, text saying that. And, uh, you know, that night I sent out an email and the next day we suddenly had interviews set up. So, uh, thank you, Jason. It's, it's very cool. I love it when people from my, my music and theater side, uh, get get excited about and interested in the podcast. So yeah, this is Rossafari Zoo News, and um, it's going to be our last normal episode for a while. Uh, as I head off to these different conferences, I'm sure we're going to have some content about that. But I do plan on still doing some normal Zoo News stuff over the next couple weeks. I know y'all love our Zoo News episodes. So um, whatever you end up getting, it'll be cool, but uh, it'll be a little different the next couple weeks. So make sure you bask in this one. Uh, and don't forget, for everybody listening, if this is your first time, boy, first of all, you're really confused by this rambling intro, but I promise it makes more sense once you get to know me in the podcast. Um, and then also, uh, just uh, you know, to let you know what's going on, this is a crowdsourced Zoo News uh, episode, meaning that every week people can email me, rossafaripod at gmail.com, 
or tag me at Ross Safari on socials or at Ross Safari pod on TikTok and uh, show me the, the stories that, that they think are good for zoo news. Um, and, and I will pick some of them and turn it into an episode. And then whether yours gets picked or not, I will say your name at the end of the episode. So that's how this works. Uh, and really quickly, just remember that you, uh, you should be subscribed to the podcast so you don't miss any of this or the interview episodes, which drop on Tuesdays. You can support the pod for as little as $3 a month by going to patreon.com slash Ross Safari. And, uh, you know, make sure you're following along on socials at all the places I just said. So without further ado, let's get to it. One, two, three, four. Ow, oh, that's a funky monkey. Treat kangaroo. Or a bench around. It's zoo news. Yeah. All right. So as you all know, last week got a little crazy with the the births. Uh, we had, like, it felt like dozens. Um, and we're not quite there this week. But before I get into uh, this segment, I did want to pause and just say, hey, listeners, let me know if you like the amount of births and deaths that I'm dropping in each week or if you want me to cut back a little bit. Sometimes when I'm recording them, uh, they feel like they go on a little too long i would never not have the segment as i think that there are certain iconic animals or animals that have been on the podcast or um you know whatever but i could choose to be more choosy about what we talk about in this section or i can just keep dropping all of them in so that you you hear them let me know what you think is best because honestly y'all I am torn. But anyway, let's get to our births for the week, shall we? All right. So uh, some exciting news hatched out of uh, Zoo Atlanta this week. Uh, the bird team announced the successful hatching of two white-headed buffalo weaver chicks. Uh, white-headed buffalo weavers are uh, part of the AZA SSP. And um, this is the first set of uh, weavelets uh, <laughs> from the uh, Zoo Atlanta adults since 2018. Um, not only are white-headed buffalo weaver populations declining in the wild, but they are also declining in zoos and aquariums, um, which is why these eggs were actually artificially incubated and hatched. And now the chicks are being hand-raised by the team to ensure success, uh, which was also part of the SSP recommendation. So pretty exciting stuff at Zoo Atlanta. Now, if you've been here for a little while, you know that I love Wildlife World Zoo and Aquarium out near Phoenix in Arizona. We've done a couple different episodes from there, including an amazing episode with two members of the Sea Lion team, which is why I literally screamed and cheered when they announced the birth of Miss Cleo, a new sea lion pup to parents Paris and Crockett. Crockett is the big, goofy sea lion that has featured in so much of the stuff that I have posted from there. And now Crockett is a dad to little Miss Cleo, and she is absolutely adorable and is already starting to make appearances on the stage. So uh, pretty exciting stuff out at Wildlife World Zoo and Aquarium. The Avian Propagation Center at the Denver Zoo has announced the birth of, this is pretty exciting, five American flamingo chicks, or flaminglets, and four Chilean flaminglets. That, for those of you who aren't good at math, is nine new flaminglets. And the really exciting news about this is that uh, the Denver Zoo is actually about to open a brand new, wonderful flamingo habitat. So these nine flaminglets are going to get to spend their lives in this incredible, beautiful new exhibit that is opening soon. Meaning that if uh, you have a chance to get out to the Denver Zoo soon, you'll have a chance to see a new exhibit with new animals, which is pretty exciting. And uh, speaking of tiny birds being born. Last week, we were talking about all these different puffin chicks that were born, and uh, it turns out that another one has joined the band, this time at Monterey Bay Aquarium, where they have a new puffin chick, also known as a puffling, or on this podcast, a pufflet, all of which are adorable. Um, the bird hatched uh, back on July 19th, and it currently weighs just over one pound. It's really cute y'all it's it's already it's already a little little ball of fluff and it's it's very cute to see i i like it so much 
And then uh, we actually have two exciting births out in the UK. And both of these births happened at the Marwell Zoo. The first one is a Grevy zebra foal, or Grevy's zeblet, uh, which is really adorable. In case you were wondering, um, zebras are born with their stripes and everything, and they do get uh, to walking and moving around pretty quickly. And, um, you know, they are, they are full zebras, and, and that might sound like a, a weird thing to say. But it's not because also born at the Marwell Zoo recently is an African wild ass, which is one of the most endangered animals on the planet and also an absolutely wonderful excuse for me to say the word ass on my podcast. Um, so uh, the, the thing that you need to know about African wild ass is that they look like a donkey with zebra legs. If you haven't seen this it's very very adorable just picture a donkey and then when you get to the legs stick on four zebra legs uh but i heard that there was some drama amongst the herds as the the um the mother of the ass was wondering uh you know if if uh i was gonna make a dumb parenting joke about the zebra and the yeah, nah, it's fine. We're not going to do that. Uh, maybe I'm the one being a wild ass right now. We're going to skip it. Anyway, but the point is that this is a really, really important birth, especially because with this species, there are fewer than 200 individuals currently in the wild. So um, two very cool births at the uh, Marwell Zoo, one of which is really important for the survival of the species. And then, last but not least, for our births this week, and this is a big one, the Indianapolis Zoo has welcomed a baby African elephant. The uh, elephant was born at the weight of 262 pounds. It is a male. But beyond being awesome just because it's an African elephant, this is the first baby ever born through artificial insemination to a mother who was also born through artificial insemination. Um, that is really important in that it shows that babies that come from artificial insemination are able to go the full distance and reproduce. So this is a big achievement for the zoo. It is a big achievement for artificial insemination uh, within the elephant community. And it's, it's just really, really exciting news. All right, and so that moves us on to our deaths for the week. And uh, while there are only three this week, uh, we've got some doozies, y'all. And the first one really hurts. I'm guessing most of you have seen this on social media by now. But the Cincinnati Zoo had to say goodbye to Red the Cheetah this week. Now, Red was born at the zoo's off-site breeding facility, along with two sisters, Willow and Catherine, and originally, Red was going to leave the zoo while the two ladies stayed there, but his personality was so wonderful right from the start that uh, the team decided to keep him on as an ambassador as well. He faced some serious, serious health challenges early on, including needing a feeding tube, which not only speaks to how amazing the Cincinnati Zoo is for, for providing that for Red, but also made him extra adorable because he had to wear either t-shirts or even onesies to protect the area that the feeding tube was in and keep it clean. So yeah, if you went to the Cincinnati Zoo when he was a cub, you could see him and his sisters playing together and there's Red bouncing around in a onesie ridiculously adorable and definitely go to at Cincinnati Zoo on social medias to see the pictures of Red in his onesie and their tributes. As life went on for Red, um, he also needed corrective hip surgery, but got through it and continued to be an amazing cat ambassador. Uh, as a matter of fact, a lot of times when Red would be on show, people, and especially children who had had feeding tubes or had had surgeries and stuff like that, uh, would comment when they talked about the issues that Red had overcome, saying that they too had these issues and, and they would connect with Red over that, which is such a beautiful thing. Um, talk about an amazing connection between, you know, people and, and animals at, at an amazing facility. 
Um, the team never, never stopped loving Red. Uh, Red was without a doubt one of the most popular cheetahs at the zoo, both for guests and for the team. And uh, Red is sorely, sorely missed. Uh, I've had the opportunity to see Red up close a couple of times and um, just a gorgeous cat. It's it's hard to see this one go. Uh, and, and I know that um, his decline in health uh, well, not unexpected with his age and everything, was fairly sudden. This this went from a fairly healthy cat to, you know, having a tough decision made fairly quickly. So uh, sending love and condolences to the team at the Cincinnati Zoo. Our next story is a sad ending to what we had thought had been a happy one a little while ago. Uh, Zoo New England announced the passing of Kamaya, one of their 14-year-old African lions. Now, if you've been listening to Zoo News for a while, you know that Kamaya has had a bunch of health issues and um, has had multiple checkups and all kinds of stuff, was off exhibit for a while, and was recently returned to exhibit with the thought being that everything was okay and hopefully uh, hopefully Kamaya was going to be fine. Uh, seemed to be doing well for a while, but unfortunately, earlier this week, he took a very sharp downward turn, and uh, within a day, the decision to euthanize needed to be made. So the team absolutely did everything they could for Kamaya and made the right choice, but um, it's hard to see that, especially in, in you know, a story that looked like it was a success. It was, it was so close, but they did do such an amazing job taking care of this lion and, and truly gave him the best chance at um, extending his life, but then also made the right choice in not letting him suffer when things did get worse. So condolences and props to the team at Zoo New England. And then last but not least in this section, the San Antonio Zoo has announced that uh, Reina, their female southern white rhino that they had announced was pregnant, has had a miscarriage nine months into her 16 to 18 month gestation period. This is a very challenging thing for the team as they were excited for the rhino birth and also because they had announced that it was coming. And I always encourage zoos to be transparent with this kind of thing. Uh, But I get why sometimes they're not, because it is hard to announce this. Um, So hopefully the team recovers well, uh, but, but sending condolences to the team at the San Antonio Zoo. All right, so moving on to other zoo news. Um, I love this story so much. Okay, so uh, recently a carpet python was taken into the Australia Zoo for a routine checkup. Now, this was a snake from the wild. I'm not entirely sure why it was taken to the zoo, but it was. And so they did a checkup and they did x-rays and they noticed that the snake had recently eaten what appeared to be a water dragon, which is a large type of lizard in Australia. Australia, as though there's any other kind of lizard in Australia. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they did the full checkup and they were like, cool, snake looks healthy, put it back in its carrier and uh, set it back out for release in the wild. When the team got to the wild and opened the carrier to release it, the snake was no longer alone. Instead, in the container was the snake and a water dragon that apparently the snake had regurgitated. So the snake was released. The water dragon was kept in the carrier and taken back to the hospital to be investigated after apparently surviving being eaten by a large python. The vet team looked at the water dragon and except for a couple of small cuts and little areas that it had bled from a little bit, uh, probably from the initial snake bites, the lizard was absolutely fine. So they observed it, they kept it overnight, they cleaned its wounds, and then they released it back out into the wild. Just an amazing, amazing story. But also, as a postscript to this amazing story, the team at the Australia Zoo affectionately named the little lizard brunch because of how uh, he got to them. So uh, awesome work by the team at the Australia Zoo. Our good friends up at Buttonwood Park Zoo have announced some really exciting changes coming in the near future. Uh, This fall, they have announced that they will be getting black bears back. Uh, Black bears left the zoo over three years ago, but now will be coming back to the zoo, which is really exciting. They are also going to be upgrading their Buttonwood Barn. And one of the really exciting renovations there is that they are now going to have 
animal ambassadors living there. It's going from a barn to an animal ambassador building. Right now, the ambassador animals live behind the scenes and you don't get to see them. So that's a really great way for people to connect with those amazing animals. I always love when zoos are able to have animal ambassador buildings. Uh, and then also they've announced that they are going to be making renovations to their wildlife education center, uh, upgrading their classrooms, restrooms, and the cafe. So lots of exciting stuff going on at Buttonwood Park Zoo. The Beardsley Zoo in Connecticut recently took their Conservation Discovery Corps teen volunteers all the way out to Yellowstone National Park on an eco-expedition. Uh, it was a really exciting time where the kids involved got to do research, field work, and scientific documentation in the study of ethology, which is animal behavior to the layperson, you know, like me, and also the geology of the landscape within the National Park. If you'd like more information about what the kids did, you can go to at C.T. Beardsley Zoo on social media. There is a video about it. Uh, but regardless, it's amazing to see a zoo taking teens out to do this kind of thing. Very, very cool. And it's not the only teen stuff that's going on right now um, because the uh, North Carolina Aquariums have announced a job shadow program uh, for the fall of 2023 that is now available um, for any schools that require community service from their students. So you can head on out to the aquarium and uh, follow the aquarium education staff to learn what it's like working with both animals and the public, uh, which to me is frankly the, the much scarier part. But um, that's an absolutely another uh, wonderful, wonderful opportunity. Uh, and if you happen to be in North Carolina and a uh, student, highly recommend you check it out. I mentioned recently that the Kansas City Zoo has changed its name to the Kansas City Zoo and Aquarium uh, because they were planning on opening a new aquarium. And I can now report that the Sobella Ocean Aquarium at Kansas City Zoo and Aquarium is now officially open. It is a 650,000 gallon aquatic center that has been years in the making and it is now officially something that you can go and check out you are in Kansas City. I have not been there yet, but I have to tell y'all, the pictures look absolutely stunning. A gorilla at the Budapest Zoo has, for the first time for any gorilla ever, been treated with stem cell treatment to help with arthritis. The gorilla in question is named Liesel and is 46 years old, where she has raised three kids and 10 grandbabies. Um, unfortunately, she has achy knees and joints, and she oftentimes would have it get so bad that she would struggle to walk on her left leg in particular. Um, so they, they looked at this and they diagnosed it as osteoarthritis. And the uh, scientists from the University of Sheffield injected stem cells donated from a younger gorilla into Liesel's knees and hips. And uh, they regenerated the cartilage in her joints, which should improve her quality of life tremendously. This is absolutely incredible science and something that I think you are going to see a lot more of in the zoo community now that it was successfully used in Liesel. The Memphis Zoo has announced a round of layoffs amongst some financial issues. Over the last multiple years, facing issues like COVID and other stuff going on, including weather issues and uh, the controversy around uh, the giant pandas at Memphis and stuff, the finances have just been a little chaotic at the zoo. And um, as such, they have recently had to lay off a bunch of their education staff, in particular their part-timers. Uh, the employees that have been laid off will be given top priority to interview for other positions as they open at the zoo, and everybody laid off has been marked eligible for rehire. So hopefully this is just a temporary thing. Um, and it's it's interesting to see... Um, the, the zoo has really grown over the last couple of years. In 2018, there were 361 employees at the zoo, and by 2021, it was up to 593. So, um, you know, unfortunately, with the finances being a little wonky and um, 
and just to be clear, I don't mean anything like crooked books or anything. I just mean very unexpected. Uh, there were years where they lost money, where they expected to make it. There were years when they made a ton of money when they didn't expect to make so much. So um, it, it's just been a struggle the last couple of years, as it has been for a lot of zoos. And uh, that coupled with the um, number of employees that were hired has now led to some layoffs. So it's unfortunate, but we love the Memphis Zoo here on this podcast. And uh, I hope everything works out and everyone is able to land on their feet and, and that a lot of them even get back to the zoo. All right. So if you've been a fan of the podcast for a while now, you remember my season two, episode one with Ron McGill of Zoo Miami. The man is phenomenal. He's an amazing communicator and, um, you know, does all kinds of national press. Uh, a lot of my zoo friends were very jealous that I got to interview him. And um, I, I could not be more proud of the man for what he has done recently. Ron recently posted in the press an open letter to the Miami-Dade commissioners encouraging them to not extend the lease of Miami Wilds, which is a proposed theme park on Zoo Miami property. Now, there are a lot of really good conservation reasons why Miami Wilds should not be allowed to happen at this property. It is a serious miscarriage of justice for the animals that live there, in particular an endangered bat species. And that's a really important message to get out there. And Ron does a ton of research. This is a very long uh, open letter. Highly recommend that you Google it and read it all. Uh, it's a great look at how effective conservation communication can be. However, the reason that it is so particularly cool that Ron did this and is so newsworthy is that this was not an open letter from the uh, director of communications of the Miami Zoo, Ron McGill. This was from private citizen Ron McGill. The very first paragraph says, To begin with, I must make it very clear that the opinions and comments being expressed here are as a private citizen and do not necessarily represent those of Zoo Miami or any Miami-Dade county government entity. And why is that important? Well, because of a later paragraph in which Ron says, I am not an attorney and have no intention to argue the legal merits of this case. For the record, I and my co-workers have been explicitly told by senior management in the county that we are forbidden from publicly commenting on this issue and that all inquiries must be referred to the mayor's office. I understand that by commenting as a zoo employee, it would subject me to charges of insubordination. So I want to again make it clear that my comments here are not as a zoo employee, but rather as a deeply concerned citizen who has watched unbridled development slowly erode away the priceless natural treasures that make Florida one of the most beautiful and biologically diverse states in the country. I can no longer just sit back and watch developer dollars dictate the future of Miami-Dade County, especially in in my own backyard. I must ask, how can the zoo profess to have conservation as a main pillar, yet allow for this project to continue on its own property? It is the definition of hypocrisy. The bottom line is that if in captivity in a zoo is the last place where certain animals can live, then zoos as institutions have failed in what should be their number one priority, to ensure that the species of animals they choose to exhibit can live in the wild where they truly belong. Y'all, Ron comes out with guns blazing. And uh, I've not heard anything about if or when or what type of discipline he may face, I really hope it's none, because not only is he just an absolute huge presence at Zoo Miami and, and does so much amazing stuff in the world beyond that, but because despite the fact that he was specifically told not to comment on this, uh, if you really dig into the article, it is an issue that he needs to comment on. Uh, he's a conservationist. He cares about this topic. I could not be more proud of Ron McGill, and I really hope that he has a huge impact on what happened here and is not punished for it. 
All right, let's do some quick hits. The Virginia Aquarium has selected Chandra Cummings as the new chief of staff of the aquarium. Uh, she brings a diverse professional background and industry skills from working within IT, human resources, and more, and is already an active member of the AZA. So that's pretty exciting. Our friends at Zoo Knoxville... Um, are up for City View's Best of the Best in uh, multiple categories, including children's attractions, children's camp, children's party destination, event venue, and wedding venue. So if you would like to go and support Zoo Knoxville, uh, you can go and um, check out at Zoo Knoxville on social media to find links to do just that. The Naples Zoo has announced that their orangutan exhibit is finally open. It's been delayed for a while now. And uh, in honor of their new redhead showing up, they have briefly changed their logo to be orange. So that's really cute. And uh, I know that my friends at the Naples Zoo have been really excited about getting these these new goobers in. And um, the team from Zoo Tampa really loved the ones they sent there. There were lots of very beautiful goodbyes and introductions on social media. So congrats to the Naples Zoo for um, getting that open and, and getting this incredible new exhibit up off the ground. The Columbus Zoo has finally announced the name of Sully's female gorilla infant born back in mid-July. The infant is named Kwame, which means quiet ruler in Swahili or teacher slash guide in Hausa. Sully and Kwame are doing well, and uh, this is the, um, the gorilla mom who they thought was male. So uh, pretty exciting stuff at the Columbus Zoo. And actually, speaking of gorillas in Ohio, I think this is really cool. Um, the Cleveland Metro Parks Zoo Gorilla Troop is going on Netflix, y'all. Uh, it's going to be a reality show where they um, they make up these storylines. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, the truth is um, that the zoo's gorilla troop is going to be featured in a weekly two-hour live stream baby gorilla cam on Netflix every Thursday from 10 to noon Eastern time for the month of September. It is also available to watch on demand. Um, so that's really cool. And viewers can help choose the name of their latest baby gorilla. So this is a really cool partnership with the Cleveland Metro Parks Zoo and, um, and Netflix. I, I love this. Uh, will we start seeing more animal cams on Netflix? Maybe. I guess it's one way to circumvent the writers and actors strike. <laughs> and then last but not least for Zoo News this week, if you want to see something really cool from Zoo Miami, uh, they did some video of a surgery that they did recently to one of their giraffes. And you can go and watch it. Um, it's it's not too graphic uh, for those who are faint of heart. I mean, we all have our own limits. Uh, I was fine, but I'm not particularly bothered by that stuff. But uh, you can go on any of their social medias at Zoo Miami and watch surgery to a giraffe. It's really cool. I highly recommend you check it out. And that brings us to... Conservation news. All right, so we're going to start off with a little bit of an F around and find out story. You know, I am obviously not a fan of anti-captivity people, and uh, there are many, many, many reasons for that. Please see the last 350 or so episodes if you're not sure what those are. But um, part of what bothers me about really any mission that people have to try and get a specific thing shut down is they don't really think about the logistics, right? We just saw this situation with um, Toki. They just they they said, okay, we're gonna we're gonna release her into a sea pen, and like there were a million reasons why that couldn't happen, and people were just like, you know, no, just do it, and it'll be fine because I'm I'm sad or something. I don't know, right? So, um, anti captivity people in France recently worked to get orca captivity banned in the country. 
This, despite the fact that many of the orcas that live in France live at Marineland Antibes, which is actually the facility with the largest and best rated uh, tanks in the world. But hey, cool, no more orca captivity. Yay! They did it. They got the law passed. So it has now been confirmed that uh, all of the orcas that live there are going to be moved to different facilities in Japan in January and February 2024. There are three different facilities that are going to be getting these orcas, and uh, transportation has already been secured uh, through, through an airline. And um, now the same animal rights people are complaining about this. They don't think that the facilities that these uh, orcas are moving to are good enough facilities. They don't think that it is okay to transport them. They, they never got past the let's ban orca captivity step. And so now uh, there are four different orcas who they are trying to force the government to keep in the country, the same government that they had banned keeping them in the country because they think that's what's best for them. It's a mess. So, um, yeah, the, the activist groups right now are attempting uh, to go through the courts and get all of this movement suspended. So, like, F around and find out, y'all. There is an area of Colombia that is known for being a biodiversity hotspot, which is known as the Choco Biogeographical Region. And recently, some researchers who set out from the Jardín Botánico del Pacífico went out into this region and discovered four new species of spiders, all different types of tarantulas. So half of you are currently shaking in your boots and the other half are really excited because I think it's pretty much just a love or hate relationship with those guys at this point. Now, you might be wondering, how did they find four new species at once? That's ridiculous. But it turns out this area is actually largely unexplored still. Like, we know it's there, but people don't really set foot in it that often, which is kind of amazing to think about that there's still unexplored land in, you know, 2023. That's absolutely amazing. And, uh, you know, though they're having people through it before, there's not been a lot of scientific study. Uh, so, for instance, the spider population there had just never really been studied before. So when this group set out, they, they were able to find four new species fairly easily. Um, it's, it's crazy to think that I'm, I'm just so excited that there is an area that is still largely unexplored in 2023. I'm blown away by this. That, that makes me really happy. Uh, but yeah, so four new species of tarantula are out there, uh, to either, you know, get you excited or haunt your dreams. You choose. So last week we talked about the catastrophic event that happened with penguins where there were entire colonies where no chicks survived. And that was that was a, a very sad bit of news. Uh, but there is some hope from another species uh, that people often confuse with penguins, uh, ironically. Um, but it turns out that uh, puffins up in Maine had a very similar experience to what penguins have had this year back in 2021, where almost no chicks survived. However, in 2022, and now again in 2023... The puffin colonies have recovered very effectively. Um, and it's really interesting because scientists did not expect this. Uh, you know, climate change has obviously been affecting the waters of New England. Uh, but it turns out that there is one type of fish, the sandlands, that apparently has not been too affected by the changing ocean temperatures and has stayed in the same area. And it turns out that the sand lance is one of the staples of puffin diets, meaning even though all kinds of other fish are moving further out from land and all the things that we talked about with the penguins last week are happening for these puffins, well, there's one species of fish who is beating the odds and as such... Um, so are the puffins. It's amazing. And it's it's also a really good reminder that while we oftentimes talk in very broad strokes when we talk about conservation, because, you know, we, like we know that in general, you know, climate change, 
making things worse for animals, killing off species. This is known. Uh, there are always these weird little stories that show that it's, it's actually a lot more complex than how we present it, um, which, you know, I, I get why, but it is something interesting to think about. And it's great news for puffins and hopefully portends that something good could happen for the penguins who had such a catastrophic year this year. Now, y'all know that I love me a good sea turtle rescue story, but this one is really crazy. Tally, a female Kemp's Ridley sea turtle, was released into the Gulf of Mexico early this week. Now, the crazy story is that uh, the turtle was found sick and um, not doing well on a shoreline back in November 2021. Okay, so far this is a pretty standard story, but let me blow your mind. It was a shoreline of the north coast of Wales. Okay, now Kemp's Ridley Sea Turtles, in case you don't know this, live in the Gulf of Mexico and occasionally go up to, like, eastern North America, occasionally. Um, but apparently, it seems like the Gulf Stream swept up this turtle and propelled her into the Northeast Atlantic, where she got lost and confused, and that actually can happen. But the weird part is that she survived, and she survived the transatlantic swim to get to Wales, where she was found and rehabilitated. It's an absolutely incredible story, and she has now been flown back to Texas, uh, where the Houston Zoo actually took her in to just kind of do some vet checks and make sure everything's okay and, and make sure that she's ready to be released. And she was. And so now Tally is officially back in the ocean with a tracker on her, um, which hopefully will not show any more transatlantic crossings. But uh, this story just makes me happy, especially in a year where there are already so many great sea turtle stories. And speaking of animals being out of place, um, two manatees have recently been sighted in the Chesapeake Bay. The uh, the first one was seen in Maryland's St. Mary's River, and the second one got caught in a net in Virginia's northern neck. Don't worry, it was fine. It was rescued. Uh, this is really crazy. Uh, they're not entirely sure what the manatees were doing up there. Um, maybe they're trying to be snowbirds? Uh, but the last time that a manatee was sighted around the D.C. area was way back in 2015. So it does happen occasionally, but but rarely. So it seems like some animals are, are getting lost lately. Giraffes have been extinct in Mozambique for quite a while now, but they no longer are. Our friends at the Giraffe Conservation Foundation have released the first group of 12 giraffe back into Mozambique at the Karangani Game Reserve, and that is just the first step in reintroducing this species to various areas where they used to live in Mozambique. So huge, huge success for the Giraffe Conservation Foundation. A new wolf pack has formed in California, roughly 130 miles north of Los Angeles, in Giant Sequoia National Monument. And this is really important, as there are just not many California wolf packs left anymore. Um, and scientists are optimistic that the pack, which includes the female's four offspring, uh, two males and two females, will adapt to its environment there. Um, hopefully so, because we really need more wolves out in nature and different packs in different areas. This could be a huge success for this species that uh, was brought on entirely by itself. You know, I mean, I love conservation work and we all need to be doing our, our part, but it's really cool seeing animals thrive and grow and and fix some stuff on their own, too. And speaking of great news and California, the blue whale population off the coast of California has nearly returned to pre whaling levels, which is just amazing and shows that that anti whaling legislation can really work. Um, this is uh, what a beautiful story. It, it's short, but I love it. And that brings us to it's time for other news. It's time for other news. Hey, no, right now, right now, it's time. It's time for other news. Hey, it's a segue to the park on other news. 
this is that kind of thing where science blows my mind sometimes. So, um, you know how naked mole rats have really long lives and are able to reproduce for all of their lives and are just these kind of weird little surprisingly hardy creatures? Well, uh, researchers in Rochester recently transferred a longevity gene from naked mole rats to mice. The end result was improved health and an extension of the lifespan of the mice in question, which is really, really crazy. So there is now thought that uh, since they were able to do that gene transfer, there could be some tweaking and uh, we could start to figure out how to extend human lifespans and um, slow down aging and all kinds of stuff, which is both really cool and kind of terrifying when you think about it. So, um... Yeah, this this might be one of those those Pandora's box situations, but hey, whatever, they did the thing and now we'll get to see what happens next. And last but not least this week, male mice are terrified of bananas. Okay, it goes a little deeper than that, but this is kind of crazy and kind of cool. So um, as some studies were being done to mice, they realized that there were certain times where uh, the male mice, especially virgins, uh, started to show a very high pain threshold and also kind of ignored the pain in question. And um, on top of that, they got more aggressive and also kind of started showing signs of fear. And they couldn't really figure out what was going on at first. So they did a new experiment to try to figure it out. And uh, they were able to realize that um, the chemical that was causing this is N-pental acetate, which can appear in female mouse urine. And that is what the males were reacting to. It's also the chemical that gives bananas their signature odor. And uh, so why, why was this a thing? Well, it turns out that female mice, and especially pregnant or new mother mice, don't really like male mice that much. Because male mice, especially ones that are virgins, are very likely to kill baby mice. Um, in, in general, rodents are more likely to commit infanticide than most species. And so a uh, super interesting thing developed where uh, female mice will absolutely go TF off on virgin male mice if they are pregnant or have babies. And so the mice have learned to react to that with a fight or flight response. So they, they run away, but they also get all like ready for a big fight and like can take more pain and all that stuff. The funny thing is that by isolating the same chemical from an actual banana and putting it on cotton balls, the mice had the same reaction. So yes, it is official. Male virgin mice in particular are particularly afraid of bananas. You heard it here first. And honestly, with the way our brains work, it probably knocked some actual important fact out of your mind. You're welcome. Animal, animal, animal holidays. Animal, animal, animal holidays. All right, y'all. And it is still September, which is Save a Tiger Month and Save the Koala Month. Don't do it at the same time or the tiger will just end up eating the koala, probably. Anyway, uh, for our individual days, the 8th is Iguana Awareness Day. The 10th is National Bilby Day. The 13th is National Mountain Chicken Frog Day. And those are your animal holidays for the week. All right, so there you have it, folks. Uh, I'd like to take a moment to say thank you to all of my patrons, especially my Red Panda-level patrons, Dr. Laura Schenk and Dr. Stephen Williamson. Uh, I'd also like to thank everyone who contributed this week. And to kind of remind you all that I did record this early on Wednesday, so I already saw, just while I was recording this, I saw multiple people sending me new stories um that they'll be there they'll be there next week probably um but yeah so just don't forget that part uh, but i appreciate you all and uh this week's contributors were anya keen colleen lenahan kim cooley carrie kirkpatrick kevin williams emily rockbuck sam stock dr laura shank becca robinson lisa claire liz dunlevy 
Elizabeth Charles, Ken Tryon, Jay Meredith, and Dylan Hoy. Thank you all so much for contributing. Make sure y'all are back here on Tuesday for another interview episode. And don't forget, friends, the words newsy credits backwards are Stiderk Yeswen. The Rossafari Podcast is produced, hosted, and engineered by John Rossi. Editing and fact-checking by John and Dr. Zoe Rossi. Our theme song is Sevens by Nathan Burke, performed by Nathan and John. Interrupting John theme and additional voices by Taylor Isaac Gray. You can reach John directly on Instagram and Facebook at Rossafari or by email at rossafaripod at gmail.com. Rossafari is part of the Daydreamer Media Network. Now, stop listening to me and go visit a zoo. has finally announced the name of Sole been cited in the Chesapeake...